Hey, cinema aficionados, Dan Patton, Screen Magazine. Thanks for checking in. We have a really wonderful show today with some great guests. But first, it should be noted that the topic we're going to discuss deals in part with femicide. And femicide is the intentional killing of women because they are women. It is a problem that has been devastating the area in and around Ciudad Juarez, a Mexican town that borders El Paso, Texas, for about three decades. The list of suspects who might be responsible for killing thousands of women in the area is extensive. However, the profile of the typical victim is heartbreakingly precise. Female, pretty, long hair, young. In many cases, less than 18 years old. In one case, 13 years old. The victims are often raped and their bodies are frequently mutilated. This scenario provides context for a feature film in development titled The Red Note. And today we're gonna to talk to the writer director of The Red Note, Mr. Craig Whitney, former editor at the Daily Texan and an award-winning filmmaker in his own right, and producer Estefania Bonilla Hernandez, a Mexico City-based professional whose credits include Transformers 5 and the Netflix series Tijuana. Craig and Estefania are also the writer director and producer of a podcast called The Red Note, which has been downloaded some 6 million times. The Red Note covers the extensive history of this area. And Craig, that's where we'll begin. When you listen to The Red Note, you hear the list of suspects who may be responsible for all these killings. Is it a serial killer? Is it a serial killers, plural? Is it complicit police? Is it the US FBI? Given all this context, and it's a nine part series, how did you extract a singular thread to create a story for the script that you wrote? Well, in terms of exploring the 30 year history of the femicide in Juarez in the podcast, um, we really tried to focus on the systemic factors that have allowed this violence to continue over the decades, rather than focusing on the individual perpetrators. I mean, undoubtedly, there are individuals responsible for these murders and disappearances. But the reason that they have continued for so long is because of uh, the failure of local government to properly investigate the murders of the drug trade that is uh, incentivizing uh, criminal groups in Mexico to continue to have a presence in Juarez. Um, those kind of systemic factors are, I think, in a lot of ways, the real perpetrators and not to, um, not to give a free pass to the people who, who, are, who are perpetrating the violence, but what has allowed it to go on are larger factors within the US and within Mexican society. And you boil this all down to a singular narrative. And what is the log line? What are we gonna see in the Red Note film that's in development? But it's about a fictional family, the Espositos, whose daughter Gabriela goes missing from a maquiladora factory in Ciudad Juarez. And the film examines uh, her mother Minerva's quest to find justice and answers for her daughter's disappearance. But it also explores the family's struggle to um, stay united. They're not just fighting to uh, get answers about what happened to their daughter, but they're also um, struggling to remain united in the face of that tragedy. As Stefania, the stylistically comparable films that I've received uh, in, in doing the research, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, The Lovely Bones, Roma. You have a budget, uh, I believe it's $1.95 million. How, is, uh, how much do you enjoy the challenge of creating a film that compares to those kind of bigger budget you know, Hollywood blockbuster styles. And, and how is the location filming in Mexico gonna help you get it done? We took these comparable films because they do treat in style and in the way how the story is portrayed and how do we want to approach the, the narratives and how do we want to approach to the story. Here in Mexico, uh, we have a lot of location managers. We have a lot of location um, part where the people and the governments from each film commissions and everything, they are really collaborative when we come with these kind of movies. They are now getting accustomed to film crews. They're getting 
could uh, used to seeing a lot of actors, seeing a lot of uh, people going over over there, and the collaboration of different industries in the craft or in the um, lighting or rental houses, they are trying to collaborate er the projects that come over there. And we're getting a really interesting collaboration. We are getting really interesting uh, professionality and proficiency from the people to develop this kind of projects over there because we do think that it's, it's, it's possible. Excellent, but we've already got some of the cast in place. Uh, Monica Del Carmen and uh, Adrian Adrian Ladron. Um, what is so great about them as a director? How much are you looking? Why cast them, and and what are you looking forward to? Why, wh what are they going to bring to the story? Monica is like Mexican Frances McDormand. I mean, she just won her third. The Me the Mexico's version of the Oscars is the Ariel Awards. She just won her third Ariel Award earlier this week. Uh, she's been nominated, I think, three times in the last four years. Is that right, Stephanie? I mean, yeah, that's right. she is she is unquestionably one of the best actors in the entire world. There is so much film talent in Mexico that the world doesn't know about. But one of the things that gives me the most joy about um, this project is having the opportunity to help share the talents of some of the people that are making this film with us to the world. Moving forward, Estefania, how are you going to tell this story and entertain viewers while also maintain some sort of dignity or respect for the current victims that are out there? I have a background in social anthropology. So for me, it was really important also to have a very fulfilling and a very true uh, sublay to the entire story. I mean, the entertainment of the movie, it's important, but it becomes a little bit of a secondary thing when we're trying to also visualize and put out there this kind of subjects. A lot of the people who unfortunately have been victims of this tragedy, they are people who does not have enough privilege or do not have enough spaces to go and put a lot of their voices or a lot of their ideas outside and try and they're almost uh, most of the time obviously trying also to make us conscious of what are the situations around our country the families have also been like um, invited to see the entire process of the movie with the podcast, obviously, we went with them to do the interviews. We were talking a lot with them. We talked with a lot of the investigators, researchers. We've also have talked about uh, with uh, news media people, you know, who have been doing their research from 10 years or more on the subject. So for us, it was really important even to understand even what words to use in dialogues, which words to use or ideas. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a fictional story, but it was really important for us even to be very careful with the words, with the way how we phrased, with the way how we want to be the, the perception, the perception about the narrative and everything that we took a lot of care with that. Excellent. And what kind of enthusiasm have you seen from the community? And, and you're dealing with a lot of vendors in Ciudad Juarez, I'm, I'm certain. How do you approach them? And how do they respond when they learn what exactly you're trying to accomplish? Well, it's it's really interesting that one of the things that we did in the first in first place, it was to approach a lot of uh, journalists. And because there's a lot of very specialized journalists talking about this issue, and they have been studying it for the past 10, 15, 20 years even. They then go and sensibilize our families. And the families, they are also very, I mean, they are very approachable. They are very open. There are people that when they can see that you're not trying to do an extractivism of, of their tragedy, because that happens, and it happens a lot when they can see that you're being really responsible trying to approach them from a channel of communication as this journalist, 
because they trust them. Um, they can also even collaborate with us. They talk with us. Um, so they are always like very open. They're always really approachable. They are the finest human beings you'll ever meet. They, they are just merciful and they are just one to, to teach us. They just want to bring us to their world for us to understand, for us to get a consciousness of it. And so they, they are really happy when we always thrive and we always like complete our projects, no? And we show them what we did and the conversation keeps going. I mean, there's always that continuous dialogue all the time. So I, I mean, it's really fortunate for us when you do it the right way. It's really fortunate to us to count on them also yeah. to be part of all the things we're doing. You've built something of value uh, and the people in the community recognize that. And speaking of the people of the community, Craig, in what way is Ciudad Juarez itself going to be a character in this film? And what do you like about Ciudad Juarez? Uh, aside from the headlines we may hear, you know, uh, up, up in, I live in Chicago and the media loves talking about what a terrible, violent place Chicago is. I love Chicago. What do you love about Ciudad Juarez? What's daily life like there? It's fascinating from a cultural standpoint because the first time I went there, it felt very Mexican. And after living for the past couple of years in Mexico City, when I went back, I realized how American it was at the same time, like the fast food <laughs> restaurants and things like that. People on both sides of the border uh, say that they're not Mexican and they're not American, they're fronterizos, they're, they're people from the border, because it is really this very uh, unique place. It's, it's a unique place in the entire world. The, I mean, it used to be one city, and after the Mexican-American War, they put the border right in the middle of what was called El Paso del Norte. Going back to the 90s, Juarez developed a reputation as the city that kills women you know but when you go there and you talk to people there's so much warmth and humor among all the people that we met uh while we were recording the podcast and i think it's a testament to just what an incredible uh city it is you know it's about a very specific um place in the same way that like taxi driver has to take place in New York. It's about what is. It's not about some generic Mexican city. And so we just felt it was really important that we didn't cut corners in that regard. And also, honestly, it just it also means a lot to us to put to give something back to that city. We've gotten so much from in a two hour movie. You can have jokes. You can have um, moments of of humor, even though that maybe that's not the dominant subject of the movie. And we really want to reflect that. And, and for the Americans out there who don't know, Sierra Juarez is so close to El Paso. I, I, thousands of people cross the border each way every day to go to and from work. And I think there's a bridge that you can walk, walk on to get from one to yes. the other. So very, it's very interesting to see that. I mean, even in Tijuana, you need to go and cross like half an hour to get into San Diego or in Matamoros with Brownsville. I mean, there's a lot like a little bit of a distance between one thing to another. But in the case of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, it's completely different. I mean, yeah. they, are, they are neighbors, literally neighbors. And it's really interesting to see, for example, to any building in Ciudad Juarez and you just are like in the fourth floor, just looking through the window and you're seeing a Wells Fargo building on the other side. Yeah. So, and also the entire community and the entire um, way how the Juarenses look at themselves is that they are from both sides. They do not, they don't have that border in their minds. They don't have that division of, you and me and Mexicans. And I mean, at a certain extent, there is something, 
but it, but it, in the fund of it, they really identify themselves that they are part of the border. We are border people. And it's really interesting also because the border in general, not only Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, but the border, the border in general, it's its own world. It's so different from Central Mexico, Southern Mexico, really different to to if somebody from Chicago, from Virginia, from New York, from it's so different being from that part of the border. There's a lot of magic around it. We also have Flowers of the Desert, which is kind of a companion documentary about the situation. In what way is it going to uh, help support this film? And, and how does it differ? Obviously, Flowers of the Desert is, is factual. And the film is, is just a, a narrative that, that grew out of it. But but how do the two compare? And when can we see Flowers of the Desert? <laughs> so yes, as you said, uh, Flowers of the Desert is a documentary. It's trying to be factual. And it's going to center, I mean, the story centers around a case that occurred in 2010 called Arroyo El Navajo, which a lot of teenage women were found dead in the desert of Arroyo El Navajo. And um, there is a theory where these people were treated as prostitutes in the United States. And there was like a traffic between the border of these teenage girls at the same time as with all the trafficking with drugs. So it's the, the documentary, it's going it's trying to explain how all the case developed around that and how the Mexican government also played a part. In Mexico, we have a femicide crisis, nationally speaking, you know, that it has to do with machismo. It has to do with um, the ways how um, the patriarchy has gone over a lot of women rights in a lot of the areas, but in this particular case had to be with all this thing about the, the narcos and all this kind of maybe the government being kind of implied on all this kind of very risky and very uh, wrongdoing thing. So, and, and we already have like four people, four families who talk to us about the case. The, the Flowers of the Desert, precisely, even the, the title, the title, it was also like thought about how flowers can even bring out from the sand, from a desert, from, and those are the voices and those are the women who are trying to achieve justice. And they all just want to be compensated. They want to be recognized, these families. They just want to be they just want justice. That's that's all. And the documentary covered a couple of specific incidents that happened. And again, Craig, going back to the first question, with all this to go on, uh, your main character, without giving too much away, are you going to be able to shed some light on all these different scenarios as you tell one singular story? Or does the, the mother uh, immediately determine who may be responsible for what happened to her daughter and just go from it that way? I think that if the film were trying to tell the meta narrative of the femicide in Ciudad Juarez. Um, not only would that be a, a, a lot to bite off and chew, yeah. but it's also a lot less interesting, I think, dramatically. And it's also a lot harder to empathize with that. I mean, um, I don't mean to quote Stalin, but Stalin once said that. Um, um, uh, one death is a tragedy and a million deaths is a statistic. Yeah. And, and without getting into the, the ethics of Stalin's totalitarianism, there's, there's a truth to that. Like it, sometimes the problem is so big that you can't comprehend it and, and you're not absorbing it dramatically and you're not absorbing it on an intellectual level. And I think actually by focusing on one family's tragedy within the larger tragedy, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot easier for an audience to absorb that information dramatically than it would be if we were 
if we were biting off um, a lot more. And dealing with this kind of subject, is it going to offer some sense of optimism or hope for the viewers? There was a story I heard the other day or an article I read the other day that I think really encapsulates like what we want to do with this movie. It was an interview with the um, anthropologist Margaret Mead. And somebody asked her, what was the first evidence of civilization that you ever saw? You know, was it a tool? Was it a house? And she said, no, it was a skeleton with a broken leg. Because, you know, in the wild, if you're a lion or a wildebeest or whatever, if you break your leg, you're dead. I mean, that's it, you know? So the fact that there was this skeleton that broke its leg and lived <laughs> means that there were people to take care of them. There was a place that they could go. They had agriculture and they had excess food that they could feed this person. They didn't have to go get their own food, you know? This person with this broken leg was the earliest evidence of civilization that she had ever seen. And I mean, this is a painful story, you know, and there's no getting around that, you know, it's not, it, and, and to deny that I think would be denying the reality of the story that we're trying to tell. But the way that the family in our film comes together to heal one another is very remarkably similar to the same way that the city of Juarez has come together in the wake of the violence that they've experienced. And we don't want to look away from the more difficult aspects of the story, but we also want to present them in a way that points the way towards um, a more optimistic and hopeful future. You mentioned Estefania, what's, what's happening now? What's the current situation in Ciudad Juarez? Mexico in general with, uh, you know, you said there's a femicide problem. Where is it and how is this film gonna hopefully help shed more light on it? I mean, we're still dealing as a country and Ciudad Juarez as its own city. We're still dealing with insecurity. We're still dealing with the drug trafficking. We're still dealing with, I mean, the, the problems that we as a country and as a continent, no, we have been like carrying on for the past 30, 40 years. So, and, but well, did you receive any opposition when you're trying to, you know, find resources and, and, you know, locations and whatnot for this film? I mean, obviously the community was very supportive, but was there anybody or any organizations that did not want this to go any further? Well, the truth is, is that if you don't mess with them, they are not going to mess with you. Okay. <laughs> That's that's kind of the, the logical around it. I mean, because obviously, I mean, a movie is just a grain of salt. It's just a grain of sand onto the avalanche and the amount of people that we are trying to get together to talk about it. I mean, and we need the goodwill from governments. We need the goodwill from, I mean, the cities. We need the goodwill from society in general to try to end everything around this with Juarez and with Mexico in general on our American continent. The thing is that we need to address our responsibilities because maybe we do have a responsibility in a direct or in a not so direct way, but we do have a responsibility on it. The governments needs to do some policies to regulate some other, I don't know if it's regulating drugs or if it's regulating other kind of issues, you know, to try to address directly to the problem, to invite to the society to study, to, con to take consciousness around the subjects. Why are the, where are the roots? How to address the roots around that? So with our movie, what we're trying to do I mean, trying to address some of those roots, some of those problems, some of those things, to tell you a story, to talk about how the people who, su who are victims of, of this suffers and suffers in a way that it does affect the rest of us. No, I mean, it's not good. It's not a good sign for any country to be losing young, young workforce in the in the hands of violent people. That's not for the convenience of anybody. 
why are we losing young people who have a lot of promising things on their lives? I mean, even if they are not going to be the next CEO, it doesn't matter. I mean, what if they're going to be the next leader of their communities? Or what if they are going to be somebody who is an amazing teacher and are going to raise people from those communities with values? That kind of thing, it's what we're missing because we are killing them. And we're killing them because of the drugs or we're killing them because of the gun trafficking. We're losing them. So it does affect us. Do you see uh, at least the recognition of the problem? Absolutely. I mean, at least here in Mexico for the past five years, there has been a lot of laws being like approved from the government trying to trying to address the gender issues around women and around uh, violence against women. The other very positive thing that I'm seeing is that there's a lot of people talking about it. And that's what with this movie, maybe we also want to do to keep the conversation going. In that way, it's how are, we're going just to be pushing and pushing. And I mean, educating ourselves, educating our kids, educating everybody around it. So the conversation still keeps alive. And that is the Red Note. Craig Whitney, thank you so much for joining us. Estefania Bonilla Hernandez, soon to begin work, I believe in 2023 on the Red Note, which is going to be a story about a family that endures tragedy in Ciudad Juarez. This is Dan Patton. Thanks for checking in.